I love the fall. Whether you have kids, you don't have kids. Um, when school starts again, we kind of get back into a rhythm. And I don't know if you feel like you've been in your rhythm, if you've hit your stride, if you're going, you know, on uh, all cylinders, firing on all cylinders, or if you felt like you kind of need a restart. But maybe there's some things that you need to start doing that you haven't been doing. Maybe some things that you need to stop doing that you have been. And maybe there are some uh, things going on in your life that you, you might want to get right with other people, with the Lord. And today is going to be a day where we begin the fall together by taking a look inside our own spirit, doing a deep dive into who we are, into our relationship with God. And I hope through this morning, through the time we spend, that if there is anything in you that um, needs doing, that you allow God to do it. And that we leave here today different than we came in. It occurs to me that many times when I talk to you about examining your heart, as we do during our communion, our Lord's Supper, um, on a, a frequent basis, is I ask you to examine your heart and I tell you to look for things that may be thoughts, actions, or attitudes displeasing to the Lord, but I don't always talk to you about what those are. And so today we're going to do a little bit more uh, of a detailed um, examination of what some of the things you might want to look at as you prepare your heart for communion. But I want to talk to you real quickly about a church that was really bad, because isn't it fun to always compare yourself to people who are really bad? If you have somebody that's really bad, you ever have that friend growing up in high school, your mom's like, you shouldn't have done that. Well, yeah, well, you should have seen what Paul did. You have that really bad friend that you always rat out to your parents or someone to make it look better uh, what you did than what they did. And maybe you still have those friends in your life. But this was a church, like you can always feel a little bit better about our own church, um, because at least we didn't do what the church in Corinth did. I mean, these guys, they were really bad. But what they had done was they had turned something that was supposed to be a um, remembrance, um, a very, very powerful, very symbolic, very spiritual reminder of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection into a party that was segregated based on popularity and money. And they had taken a church where the ground is supposed to be level at the foot of the cross, and they had um, really made the ground unlevel. And what I mean by that is there were factions in the church. There were smaller groups of people in the church who felt like they were better than other people. Some uh, maybe had been there longer, so they felt like that they you know, had a little bit more stake in it or, or should be there. Some maybe were related to the right people and felt like maybe they could make the calls or call the shots they wanted. Some had a lot of money and could push their way around. You know, some, I think, were just sneaky and political and were always just sort of in the right spot, hanging out with the right people. And then there were people who just needed to be there, wanted to be there, realized their dependence on God, um, but just were left out of things that were important. And communion or the Lord's Supper used to be a dinner back in Jesus' day. And then after Jesus ascended into heaven, it sort of went through some iterations where it was a, usually a household thing, communion, that was done in the evening meal. Then it became a weekly thing. And then they began to celebrate the love feast, which was a, a potluck that everybody could come to. And what happened was that the people who were on, in the in crowd in this church would set the rules and they would say, listen, let's tell everybody else that it begins at seven, but let's all get here at six. And let's make sure by the time everybody else gets here at seven, we've eaten all the good food, we've drank, had all the great wine, it's all gone, that we've already talked about all the things that we want to talk about, probably the people who are going to be coming at seven. And um, then we can get around to the spiritual stuff at the end. And the Apostle Paul, who was a church planter and a pastor, was just absolutely incensed by this. How could you have taken something that's so special, that's so meaningful? How could you take a symbolic reenactment, a personal reenactment of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and make it filled, wrapped around your own personal agenda. And when you begin to read 1 Corinthians, particularly 1 Corinthians 11, you see that there are all kinds of themes that are wrapped around the state of the heart of the people. And so I'll point out some of those themes today. But one of the most important things to remember is that when we participate in communion, when you and I as believers in Jesus Christ, followers of Christ, as most of us are, that when we do it, we have to take it seriously, that we have to examine our hearts. And when we do it, we come back as we come to this table to Jesus, just like we did in the first place. 
which is nothing held back. No fine print in our contract. No prenup that we have stashed away or golden parachute just in case things don't work out between God and us. And so the Apostle Paul writes some instructions to a church that's worse than most churches. But as with any group of people, when we gather together, we can at least see glimpses of ourselves in there. Let me read it to you. For whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, they eat and drink judgment on themselves. So what the apostle Paul says is that when we take communion, we take it seriously, that we examine our hearts. When's the last time you examined your heart? Well, what's that look like? I look at our hearts like a home, like a house. And if you came to my house right now, most of it's clean, the parts people see, but there's parts of my house that aren't super clean. I got a drawer in the kitchen. It's called the junk drawer. Anybody else have a junk drawer in their kitchen? Look at all this confession going on right there. You don't have a junk drawer in your kitchen? You do, I know she does. Oh, <laughs> we're calling out our spouse. Sometimes we have a junk drawer in our life where we just have junk stashed away. And someone's like, hey, do you have a pen? You're like, yeah, but don't go in that drawer. We don't want them to open it and see everything piling out. Some of us put all of our junk in the spare bedroom when someone else is coming over because we don't want them to see it. And so I look at the examination process as inviting the Holy Spirit of God into my home, to my heart. I'm like, all right, God, show me what you see that shouldn't be here. Because God wants everything for us. He wants us to walk with him and to have an abundant and fulfilling and meaningful life that goes past this life and into eternity. And what he tells us is the stuff that we have there, you think you want it, but you don't because it keeps you and I from being who we need to be together. Joy and I, we like to walk. We live in the mean streets of Southwest Ankeny in the Prairie Trail neighborhood. We have alleys in Prairie Trail. And when you grew up, did your mom ever tell you that all kinds of terrible things happen in back alleys? Yeah. I have walked the back alleys of Prairie Trail for three years now and not one bad thing has happened to me. But my mom might be right. You never know. But we like to walk. And in the fall, um, I, I wear weight vests sometimes to make it harder. Who knows why you want to make it harder? And it was the first day I put a weight vest on. Joy and I are walking. Now, Joy doesn't pay any attention. She has no situational awareness. We could be attacked by the Prairie Trail ninjas or street gang at any point, and we, she would never know. When she walks, she walks and she walks like this. And she looks and she's looking to see if anybody started decorating for Halloween yet. She's looking to see if anybody got their house painted. I mean, she can tell you every detail about the neighborhood, but she could step in a hole and never come back and not even see it. So it's my job, situational awareness. And so I'm a little bit tired, first day wearing the weight vest. And when we walk, we cross a few streets, we have a route and we time ourselves with our Apple Watch. And um, I have to give the instructions, which is always a suggestion when you give instructions to your wife. If you're married like I am, let's cross the road. And so she'll turn and she'll just cross and she's looking at stuff, right? And so I listen for cars and usually look. And the ones that'll hurt you are the ones you can hear coming. The Ford Raptors, right? Whoa, the, with the big tires, whoa, 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 whoa. the school buses, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. You know, you can hear them coming. UPS, the stuff that, you know, you got to really watch out for. So you don't really have to look as much as you listen. And I only want wear one earpiece in case I get an important phone call or want to listen to music while we're walking so I can hear. And so you don't ever want to step off the curb in front of a truck because you die, right? So Joy and I are walking. I'm tired. So instead of looking, I just listen. And I said, let's cross. So Joy takes her foot and just steps out blindly. I step out blindly. And I just about got smoked by an electric CRV driven by two 85-year-olds <laughs> who could barely see over the steering wheel. And all I heard was, you didn't even, it was just 
like these tiny little 13 inch tires on concrete and no noise. And I about died. If I die, I want to die. I want to go out a big rig. I want to go out by, you know, a Jeep Scrambler on 37s or something that's a gladiator, something big, not a CRV that you can't hear coming, but both will kill you, right? The things you see, the things you don't see. So the apostle Paul, he says, examine your heart. And some of us know there are things in our house that shouldn't be there. Thoughts, actions, and attitudes displeasing to the Lord. And we ignore them. And you and I both know what ignored sin does in life. It compounds over time and it brings death. It brings death to relationships, beginning with those closest to us and works itself out over time. But yet there are also things in our life that can be roadblocks to us in a right relationship with God that we don't know about. We don't see the electric CRV driven by the 85 year olds that'll still kill you, even if you don't know it's coming. King David, man, he resonated with this and he wrote about it in Psalm 19. He says, who can discern their own flaws? That's why it's so important to have people in your life who can help you see your own who do it in a constructing and loving way, who are for you, not against you. And most of all, who you listen to when they point things out that may not be right. Who can determine their own faults? And he's praying and he says, God, forgive me my hidden faults. Those things that can still kill me and bring death in my relationships and in my life but the things I don't know are there. Forgive me from the electric CRV. Keep your servant also from the willful sins, the stuff I know is there that I need to get rid of, but I just haven't decided to do it yet. And you may have your own reasons and they might be good reasons to you, but it doesn't mean we don't do the hard business of confessing and letting these things go. And so David's just drilling down to the heart of the matter, wanting a clean heart, wanting a pure heart, wanting rightness between he and God. And he says, God, look, the things that are in my life that I need to, to get right, I want to get right, but show me those things that I don't even see because I don't want them to rule over me. I want to be blameless before you, innocent of great transgressions. And he said, may these words, may my prayer, the words of my mouth and the desires of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And so in a few minutes, as we're preparing our hearts for communion, for the Lord's Supper, I'm gonna walk you through a few areas that you might consider a guided tour through your house. Now there are more rooms, there are more cupboards, there are more drawers that I'm going to point you toward. But I think maybe I failed you from time to time by walking with you to the point where I point you to the scriptures and ask you to examine your heart, but I don't really help walk you through the process of what that might look like. And so today, briefly, after we sing a few songs and you have time, to really prime that spiritual pump, to sing praises to the Lord. I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk to you about a few areas that we can look at. And then we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. As we prepare to sing, I have some friends who I've asked to just come and stand in the front here on the sides. People who, if um, I want someone to pray for me, these are the people who I would ask. And if you have a burden you're bearing for someone else, which are sometimes the hardest burdens to bear, or one maybe you're bearing for yourself, and you want someone just to pray with you and for you or for your friend or your family member, we're just gonna be up here in the front on the sides. Just come on up. If you don't wanna come up, look at us and say, come here and make sure we know what you're talking about because we're not just gonna come if you're a little, being a little shady about it. We wanna know you want us there. But if you want us, we're going to come. We're going to pray with you. If you don't want to do that, you have some cards in the seat backs in front of you. 
And if you have a request that you'd like our prayer team to pray for throughout this week and even this morning during the service, you can write those on that card and you can come and hand them to one of us in the front or you can drop them in the box on your way out. But I believe in the power of prayer. And I believe that prayer changes things. I believe that prayer changes us. And I believe that prayer can change circumstance. And I know that one of the things that Jesus modeled and that I depend on is going to the Lord in prayer. And from personal experience, sometimes the most powerful thing that I can do is to pray with a friend. There's just something special about it. So I invite you to do that. Well, a good dog's a good thing and a bad dog is a bad thing. And um, anybody have any bad dogs here? You still feed them, you still, yeah. You still take care of them, they're still just bad dogs. I don't have any bad dogs. Um, my sister did though. And she asked me to watch her bad dog one time. This dog's name was Holly, it was a little bulldog. And um, she's like, hey, watch my dog. Joy and I, you know, we were parents at the time, still our parents, had two boys younger at the time. And uh, she goes, I need you to watch the dog. And I said, well, what can be so difficult about watching the dog? And they said, well, Holly runs away. And um, I said, what do you mean runs away? She goes, every time we open the door, the dog takes off and tries not to come back. And I was like, Christy, what's so bad about your house that that dog doesn't want to stay? That's just brother sister talk, right? Um, there is nothing wrong with her house. There's something wrong with the dog. And she goes, just don't lose my dog. I'm like, how, how hard could it be? We had a dog, you know, they'd be friends, little dog friends. The dog didn't want to leave my house. And do you know what happened? That dog wanted to leave my house. And my little son, Nathan, opened the door and the dog took off, boom. And I mean, when I took off, it didn't look back. And uh, last I saw it, it was running down the street and just disappeared into a little trail of dog dust. And um, my sister's gonna kill me. She had kids. Uh, they were gonna be disappointed. The dog was gonna get hit by a car. So what do you think I did? Joy and I and the boys, they're on their scooters. We ran out there and found this dumb dog, brought it home, ran away again. What do you think we did? Boys on their scooters, ran out, found the dog down at the park, brought it home. And so I said, Joy, we can't keep chasing this dog down. This is getting annoying and uh, we might not catch it. I said, what do we do? Joy's super smart, as you know. And she took a Sharpie. And the thing you should know about Holly is that every time she would run up to somebody, very friendly, she would roll over on her back, do like dogs do, all splayed out, or even feed a rubber belly. She's a bad dog, she didn't care. She still wanted her belly scratches, but that's what she would do. If she met you, she'd roll over. In the park, she'd roll over. So Joy took a Sharpie and wrote our phone number in big black letters on her stomach, across the dog's <laughs> stomach, and then wrote, call me, which I thought was hilarious. And sure enough, Holly took off running down the street and we're like, we're gonna see if your plan works. So we just stood there waiting, you know, and sure enough, the phone rang. One of our neighbors just laughing as hard as they could laugh. I found this dog laying on its back. It had this phone number and said, call me. And so they brought the dog back and handed it to us. It worked really, really well. And um, I was kind of thinking about that. And I was kind of thinking about our own lives spiritually. And sometimes instead of you and I staying home because it's where we want to be, we gauge our spirituality by how many days it's been since I ran out the door. How many days has it been since I didn't come home? How many days has it been since I slipped through the cracks? And we start talking about things like, well, I came to church every single day and I even prayed before I ate breakfast yesterday. And, you know, I saw this guy and he needed two bucks. I gave him two bucks. And we start, we start naming all of these things that are supposed to convince us and everyone else that we're living the life God wants us to live. But in reality, we don't want to stay home. What does it look like to live a life where Jesus Christ has written his name on our hearts? And the only place we wanna be is with him. And sometimes we get so afraid when the doors get kicked open in our world. But the, the desire is not to run then the fear isn't there. And as I read Paul's teaching to this church, and he told them to examine their hearts, a lot of what he talked to them about, it wasn't just this relationship between them and God. 
But what he talked about was that it's impossible for this relationship to be right unless this relationship is right. And this relationship is right. And I have just a few things we're going to discuss very briefly that really work out from a concentric circle going from the largest to the smallest or the most visible to the least visible. The things I'm going to talk to you about, of course, we should be doing on the outside where everybody sees and can observe and evaluate. But these are marks of genuine spiritual growth and maturity. And the first thing is very simple. It is, are you growing? Is God doing anything in your life right now? Do you see the work of the Holy Spirit in you? And not just this way, but this way. The Bible tells us that a person who's growing is like a tree planted in the right location. That in its time, it produces fruit. And the fruit that a life produces, a life that's growing, is visible. But a lot of times, this isn't as visible as this is. And have you ever been around somebody where you can just see the this is just so right that you know the this is in order? And as I've been thinking about this this last week, I see the Apostle Paul, he, he really, I think, points out a few flaws that this church was experiencing that you and I, we don't want to experience, but they go much, much deeper than just the superficial. And I don't want to just leave you with the challenge to examine your heart. I want to walk you through some things that maybe will help as God opens up cupboards and junk drawers and closets and guest rooms. Are you serving? Now, my assumption is that, of course, we're serving because it's our spiritual family. But that's visible and everyone can see that. But are you a person who views your role here in this life and on this earth as one of being a servant, as one who wants something for the world around you and not from them. The one who serves the people who no one sees or the ones who have to be around you like your family or perhaps employees or friends that just won't quit do you serve them just like you want to be seen serving when you think that it may count? Is your heart for other people? And they're not an inconvenience, but they become the point. Where their victories in life, spiritually and otherwise, become more important than your own. Because Jesus kept losing personally so that you and I could win eternally. And I want to be like him. Are you giving? One of the problems with the church in Corinth is they become stingy and they designated what they did give and they tried to withhold from people. And of course, we're giving on a church level. But are you a generous person? Jesus tells us from his own mouth that if you want to know where your heart is, then show me what you do with your treasure. And generosity should certainly be demonstrated through a church, through the body of Christ, but it must work itself in to where you're truly a generous person with the people who are closest to you, where you're a giver, not a taker or you're an investor in lives, not a spender to consume. Where you view your resources as God's resources and your perspective is, God, how can I be used by you? Are you forgiving? Because grudges and grievances and factions unspoken negative sentiment, unforgiven offenses. 
Well, it drove the church in Corinth apart, but can certainly drive any church apart, but particularly as you drill down and you look at your own relationship with those closest to you and the people who've wronged you, it can drive you apart from God and from whoever you care about. And forgiveness is not always a one-time act. I saw one of the most powerful and supernatural demonstrations of that that I may have ever seen in my entire life this last week. Sometimes forgiveness is just a step toward God in the right direction. Where you're saying what happened is not okay, it doesn't mean that they're not consequences, and it doesn't mean you have to have relationship again, but it means that you're taking steps to give to God the wounds that someone has given to you and not carrying that with you any longer. And I've seen it happen. And I know the freedom that comes. But some of us hang on. And a person who's walking with God, not focused on whether the door is open or shut, not counting the number of days, I haven't run away, but really trying to get in step and rhythm with the Holy Spirit. They're serving. They're generous in giving. They are forgiving. And part of forgiveness, I think, maybe that we don't always talk about is sometimes you have to forgive yourself. Jesus may forgive, but sometimes we don't forgive ourselves. And sometimes, don't judge what I'm saying, just hear what I mean. I want to make sure I can see you all. You have to forgive God. And it's not because he deserves or needs forgiveness because God doesn't sin. But it's because you're holding a grudge because he didn't do what you expect him to do and he didn't do what you asked him to do or begged him to do. And you've got to get to the point where we let it go and say, God, I don't understand, but you're God, I'm not. And being right with you is more important than me winning my argument with you. Well, finally, this last one, and it relates to the church in Corinth, but relates to us today is, are you persevering? Has your disillusionment and disappointment with other people, with unanswered prayers, with living in a world that has set itself up against following God, led you to the point where you're just about ready to quit? And you wonder if this whole faith thing is really worth it. And you're not the first person to wonder that. It's human, it's natural, because life is disappointing. We learn in the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes that good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people and that life this side of heaven is not fair. But just because it's not always fair doesn't mean that it's not right. And sometimes with those closest to us, we're ready to quit. And we have to ask ourselves the question, did Jesus ever quit on me? How many times did he run down the street and bring me back home? So Jesus didn't quit on me. I can't quit on you. You can't quit on your kids, your husbands, your wife. You can't quit persevere. Don't leave your faith behind. Can you imagine what living this life without faith, without a personal relationship with Jesus would be like? For me, it's not worth it. My two words, the reason I follow Jesus, hope and meaning. Without my faith, life is hopeless and meaningless. And thinking about walking away shows a wrong view of myself and a wrong view of God. So don't quit. Well, here are a few things to think about. And what I'm going to do is ask Brian Heron to come, and he's just going to sing a song for us. Not just any song, but a song that will help us reflect 
And perhaps one of the areas that I have um, shared with you is an area that you want to um, do some business with God in. But I want to, just as the apostle Paul instructed his church, I want to ask you, in your own way, as you get alone by yourself in a group, say, God, welcome into the home of my heart. Show me the things that I know are there that I haven't had the courage to get rid of and give me the courage to confess them and give them to you. And God, look through my junk drawer, open the cabinets, kick open the door to the guest bedroom. If there are things I've forgotten about, things that I wasn't aware of until today, reveal them to me and give me the courage to confess them and to make them right. Because it's so important. And as we examine ourselves, this is all part of preparing to come and participate in the Lord's Supper. And I'll explain that more in just a minute, but what I want you to do right now is nothing except sit and be alone with God, listen to this song, and allow God to search the home of your heart. You know, the process of introspection, of examining the heart, it's not about stressing yourself out because you're not perfect. Um, none of us are, are perfect. It's about being honest. And that's what I can't stress enough. It's about honesty. It's about honesty with God. It's about honesty with myself when I look in the mirror. And it's about transparency with the people around me, closest to me, working itself out. It's about acknowledging the fact that we don't deserve to be here. Do you know when I was in seminary, in Bible college, even going all the way back to youth group, my professors sometimes would teach you how to share your faith. And they would say, if you walk up to somebody, say this, if you were to die right now and go before God and he were to say, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? Have you ever heard that question? Is that just me? And they armed you for answers and responses to teach you how to convince all these non-Christians to go to heaven. And the answer is supposed to be, at least what I was taught, but you give them a date that you became a Christian and you give them your resume and you tell them the stuff that you've done. And I'm doing something kind of fun in my own personal time. I encourage you to do it too. I'm reading the gospels in my own personal life. And uh, one of the reasons is because you and I've spent so much time in the gospels here lately and we're gonna keep going through the fall. But I'm reading Matthew, just finished Matthew. You started Mark yesterday and um, going slow, just three chapters a day, four chapters a day. And as I was thinking about this question and thinking about Jesus after I finished the book of Matthew, if God were to really ask me, why should I let you into heaven? If I'm standing face to face with God, this is the answer that came to me in my spirit and I'm convinced is the only answer we should give. Rick, why should I let you into heaven? You shouldn't, God. I don't deserve to be here, but Jesus. And when you see me, you see Jesus. And Jesus wrote his name on my heart when I gave myself to him, confessed my sin, believed who he was, and decided to follow him with my life. And because of that, he is home. It's who I want to be. It's where I want to be. And sometimes things get in the way. And that's why we examine our hearts before we receive communion. The Apostle Paul gave instructions to his friends at this church as they received communion, the same ones I'm going to read to you right now. They look a little bit like this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it because the bread symbolized his body, this body which is for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. The sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross where he took on my sin and yours, where he died and rose again, defeating sin, Satan, and death once and for all. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, which represented his blood, and said, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So whenever you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim, you identify, you relate, you demonstrate Jesus' death until he comes to collect you and me to be with him forever. So when you come to the table in a minute, if you have done your business with God, you're coming back 
in a way, in a sense, recreating the moment you came to Christ in the first place. Nothing held back, no known sins stashed away, no prenuptial agreement or fine print in the contract. Nothing that you have that you don't want him to see is best you know. And when you come and you eat the cracker and you drink from the cup, you are symbolizing and identifying with Jesus' death, the sacrifice that he made for us. You don't have to be a member of our church to participate in communion, just a member of the body of Christ, a Christian. Between you and the Lord. And then after that, I'm going to come up and I'm going to dismiss you. But right now it's time to celebrate. We have contemplated, we have confessed. And now we come and we participate together because of Jesus. Father, we thank you for days like today where we as a church family can come and can celebrate in a small way, a symbolic reenactment of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross in the tomb, his resurrection. And I thank you that you loved us so much that you've offered forgiveness, that you've offered a fresh start, that you'd offered hope and meaning, a significance that goes beyond this life into the, the real life to come, that you've given us a community, a family, a partnership, a friendship to live this life together. That as we as a church family continue to try to pursue you, to keep you at the center, guide and direct every step that we take as we begin again into this fall, moving into a new year and the spring to come. Most of all, I pray that you allow people to see Jesus in us, the way we treat each other, the way we react and respond to the world around us. the way, the character that you are building in us as the Holy Spirit has more and more control of our lives begins to show up in fruit that's unmistakably created by you. Because now we live in a world and in a time where people desperately need to see you. Let us be part of that. I thank you for my friends who are here and I love them, Father. But you love them far more than I do and that's what counts. Thank you for never giving up on us. In Jesus' name, amen.